So what I want to do here is look at solving an even more generalized Gaussian integral than we've looked at so far. So the integral that I want to solve is this integral minus infinity to infinity x to the 2n e to the minus a x squared dx. And so, so far we've looked at solving a whole bunch of types of, uh, a whole bunch of different types of Gaussian integrals where we had e to the minus a x squared minus b x minus c. We've solved that. But now what I'm going to do is look at solving integrals where we have this, this pesky x to the 2n out in front multiplied by, in, in this case, just a simple Gaussian, just something centered at zero. And I'll make one comment real quick. Um, the reason why it's got to be 2n out in front and not just n is because for odd values of this exponential or of this argument right here, we have an odd function times an even function. And so that'll always be equal to zero. And because of that, the only cases that'll give us something non-zero are when we have uh, some, some even number right up here, some, some even degree polynomial. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, how are we actually going to solve this thing? And the way that we're going to solve it is by using this trick, and it's it's called the Leibniz's integral rule, or or sometimes more colloquially as as differentiating under the integral sign. And the property is written like this: d d a. So if we take the derivative of some integral, and let's say it goes from alpha to beta, uh, beta, and let's say it's a function of both a and x, and we're integrating with respect to x, then this right here is equal to that same integral from alpha to beta, but you can move the derivative inside of the integral. Because the, because, because the integral and the derivative uh, are, are with respect to different variables. That, that, that's the main idea here. So this is, this is the property that we're going to use to solve this integral. And, and the way that we're going to solve it is like this. Uh, first, let's note that, all right, well, this integral right here is actually the same. It's actually the same as taking minus 1 to the n. It's the same as taking n derivatives with respect to a of just a Gaussian. Now, now let's think about this for a second. Right? What, what, what am I saying here? I'm saying that, well, if we, well, let's look at this exponential here. If we take a derivative with respect to a, what's going to happen? Well, we're just going to pull down a, net, a minus x squared, right? And then if we take another one, what's going to happen? We're going to pull down another x squared, and we'll have x to the fourth out in front, and we can keep doing that. And all of these derivatives of a will just pull down another factor of x squared with, with a minus sign. So that's why we have to have some minus 1 to the end. But, but, but the principle here is clear, right? This integral is just the same as taking a bunch of derivatives of this uh, this Gaussian function with respect to not that x but this a. Okay, uh, that's great. But now that's this is where this this Leibniz integral rule becomes relevant because what we can do now, what we know from this is that we can pull out this derivative. We can pull it out, and then what we're left with is d n d a n, and I should leave this minus one to the n here, times integral minus infinity to infinity e to the minus ax squared dx. Now wait one minute, this right here, this integral right here, uh, this is the first integral we did, right? This is just the integral uh, for some Gaussian centered at the origin. And we know how to do that. And we know that when we do that, what we get is square root pi over a. That's what we found in the very first video. Okay. Great, so now this, this whole problem, this, this problem which originally looked kind of daunting, is just reduced to taking a whole bunch of derivatives of this, this thing right here that we're, that we're intimately familiar with, this square root uh, pi over a. And so uh, it'd be kind of nice if we had some closed form for this thing for generalized n, because you know if, if, we're, if we're picking n equals 10 or 100, you don't want to take 100 derivatives, right? And so it'd be nice to sort of look at a couple cases and try and figure out what the general rule is. Uh, and so I'm going to do that. So let's start by looking at a couple cases of this. So for n equals 1, what do we have? Well, we're going to have, we're going to get what? We're going to get minus 1 times the first derivative of this guy. Now, and I'll write this as root pi times a to the minus 1 half. And then, and then it's clear, right? We know how to take this derivative. We're going to get minus 1 half out in front, so we're going to get root pi over 2. 
minus signs cancel, a to the minus three halves. Okay, and another way of writing this is as root pi over two root a times a. And, then, and, and you'll see later on why I'm writing it like this. Um, but, all right, that's our first derivative. That's our x squared times this guy in this integral. Uh, what about n equal two? Well, for n equals two, what we're gonna have, uh, we're going to be taking the derivative of this guy with an extra minus sign out in front. So we're gonna have minus one times root pi over two dda a to the minus three halves. Okay, what happens here? Well, same thing. We know how to take this derivative and what we get is uh, root pi over, okay, and then what's gonna happen? We have a we have a three halves coming out in front now, so we're gonna have a two squared in the denominator, a three up top, all over, or all times, a to the minus five halves. And this we can also write in some form like this as root pi over two to the two, square root a, a squared with three, which I'll suggestively write as three times one. Um, okay, a little bit of a pattern's emerging, right? So we first we had a two, then we had a two squared, and you can kind of guess we'll probably have a two cubed. And same thing here, we have we know just from the from the rules of differentiation, you know, if we have a root a from the get go, then we're just going to keep pulling down powers of a which is with each derivative, and then we have this this factor out on top this three times one and then so let's do one last case and then I think the pattern will be perfectly clear. Uh, so now we want to take the derivative of, the, of this guy. So we have uh, root pi over two to the two times three dda of a to the minus five halves. And so what happens? Same story as before. We have root pi over two cubed and then we have five times three times one times a to the minus seven halves, also known as square root pi times five times three times one over two to the three root a, a cubed. Okay, now the pattern's starting to look pretty clear. And let's, uh, and so for, for, for arbitrary n, for arbitrary n, let's guess it. We're gonna have, well, it looks like we're always gonna have some root pi and then what? We're going to have some two to the n, right? Because we're seeing that with each with each derivative, what's happening is we're pulling down some power that looks like this, and this power is only is always going to have a one over two. And so because of that, we're going to have this one over two to the n. And what else are we going to have? Well, we're going to have this uh, square root a times a to the n, right? Because that's that's also just true from the derivative, right? We we have we start off with a root a. And then with each power of the derivative, or with each with each n, we're pull, we're going to pull down another a. And so, okay, so that's going to be there. And so then the only last thing that's a little mysterious is this constant on top, because we can kind of see that what's going to happen is we're going to have all of these odd numbers multiplying out, right? So we're going to have, you know, in this case it was three times one because when we took the derivative, we we went from uh, from from five to three. Or, or from three to five, and then from five to seven, and then, you know, if we keep going seven to nine, nine to 11. And so this, this numerator right here is going to be described by multiplying together all of the odd numbers down from, from what? From two n minus one. And the word for this is, and, and the way of writing this is as a double factorial. And so what a double factorial is, is, um, and I'll show you some examples. So if we do like seven double factorial, this is seven times five times three. And so it, it's it's sort of like a, a normal factorial, but you're, you're ignoring all of either the odd numbers or the even numbers. So I, I could also do like a six factorial, and this would be six times four times two. Or, or 10 factorial would be 10 times eight times six times four times two. Or, or nine double factorial would be nine times seven times five times three. Okay, and, and we can see that's what's appropriate here, right? So for, for each one of these, so let's look at n equals two. For n equals two, we know that we should have three times one. And so that means that this guy right here should be three double factorial. And we get that when we plug in two, right? Because we're gonna get four minus one, which is three double factorial. And same thing here. 
uh, when we put in n equals 3, we're going to get 6 minus 1 double factorial, which is 5, 5 double factorial. And so we've done it. Uh, we've taken uh, this integral up here, which, you know, from the get-go, we didn't really know how to solve because uh, we had this funny, poly this funny monomial term out in front. But using Leibniz's rule, or the differentiating under the integral sign trick, which is a super useful trick. We were able to uh, reduce this this hard integral right here to just a matter of taking a bunch of derivatives. And then just by, by fleshing out the combinatorics of it, we were able to get a closed form solution for this integral up here. And so I think I'll stop here. Um, in the next video, in, in the next video, I'll look at generalizing this one step further. And so you could have asked, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I, I kind of restricted this by saying we we're looking at stuff like e to the minus ax squared. What about e to the minus ax squared minus bx minus c? What about that type of stuff? And that ends up being a little bit harder than this because we can't always, uh, we can use the same trick, but it's a bit harder to do. Um, so I'll take a look at going into that in the next video.